Greetings, unsettled souls. <laughs> Sam I.B. DeGange doing political commentary for the media speaks. Uh, you might know me from Blasting News, might know me from uh, Wits News, and uh, well, guys, I'm here doing the massive Fukushima update. I want to hope everybody had a good Fourth of July. Um, I do want to remind everybody that Christmas in July is coming. Some people might find that to be the best day of the year. Then again, maybe just me. Friends, I wanted to go ahead and to just kick it off with so an interesting theory that some uh, person of limited intelligence had recently put on my comment line. It was implied that the massive radiation levels that we are reading are somehow not a danger to people and to prove this was a lot of contrived bunk science from the very people who are responsible for lying to everyone about the dangers of nuclear because they are tied into the industry. So what I've gone out of my way to do is to use a number of sources here they're in the comment line as well uh, on the YouTube video comment line. Uh, description, I should say. I wanted to focus on not just the sources, but the number of sources that are uh, 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 that are usually within one work. For instance, we've been talking about the increase in quake activity here, starting in January. I think there was one month out of the last six or seven where I wasn't talking about how severe the quake season was becoming and it wasn't something I didn't sit over my crystal ball before I did the show to come up with this theory. I didn't pull it out of a hat or just start rambling hoping that it sounded dire enough that people would click on it. Hey Chad, that's not what I did. I looked at the data that was extant for anyone that cared to look at it. And brought it. So now we're looking at California and earthquakes all over and the the severity is growing as predicted. And we're still looking at nuclear power plant issues, such as such as San Ofri. Now listen to this. This is from the Mercury News. For those that say that I don't give sources. And the Mercury News is loading quite slowly. Earthquakes, radioactive waste and that nuclear power plant on the California coast. For those of you that don't know, power plants are extremely susceptible to these kinds of disasters because without some kind of way to rapidly and constantly cool these reactors, the outcome is Chernobyl, Fukushima, wind scale, you name it. And during recent tests that were conducted after the Fukushima disaster, it was discovered that there were a number of dams in the United States, which should they rupture in some kind of an event, would in fact create a Fukushima-like scenario for people to deal with in the United States. Now, that doesn't mean that the outcome is going to be the same. Could be worse. It could be better. We don't know. But the idea <clears throat> that when they're not on, you know, the, the shore, that they're immune from these kinds of problems, that isn't true. Because, of course, places that the dams and a number of water reservoirs could prove quite an issue. So what would happen, it asks, to the shuttered Santa Fe nuclear generating station in a big earthquake? And again, they tried to keep it open forever, claiming it was safe when it was anything but. The answer, of course, depends on exactly where the quake is centered and how much the ground beneath the plant shimmies and shakes. But one horrific scenario can be rolled out. Despite frequent comparisons to San Ofri, to Chernobyl, and Fukushima, <clears throat> there can be no core meltdowns, thankfully, at San Ofri because its reactors have been shut down for seven years. Nuclear fuel has been removed from them. Atoms are no longer split at the site. Instead, the risks at San Ofri Center on how its 3.6 million pounds of highly radioactive waste 
produced over some 40 years of generating electricity for California are stored and safeguarded. Now that is the other issue which I think a lot of people forget about and that is that let's say that we build the absolute best repository for this material and we're going to get to some of that some of those ideas in a, in a couple stories here but let's say that we build the ultimate reservoir for this sort of insanity and this building or this structure or this hole in the earth or whatever it is we devise is solid safe well, it really is good to know that terrorists would never like to sabotage such a thing. And it's good to know that since these radioactive materials in the waste remain deadly for eons, it's wonderful to know that terrorism just ended and it's not going to be around anymore, so we won't have to worry about the perfectly solid sound structure being used as a weapon. Currently, the majority of Santa Fe's radioactive waste cools in spent fuel pools adjacent to the reactor domes. Those pools, are far, those pools are far more vulnerable to the elements than the dry storage systems that they will eventually house the waste, and where it will likely remain decades until the federal government finds a permanent home, which is another story. Um, concrete monolith. While pools require electricity and water to keep fuel cool, dry storage systems do not. Earthquake-inspired power outages could cripple pools, but not dry storage systems, which are deemed passive. San Ofrige, dry, San Ofrige dry storage employs massive slabs of concrete designed to withstand more than twice the ground shake as to spent pools of the reactor itself. Inside those dry systems, designed by Holtec and Arriva. Now, Arriva are the ones, are the company that couldn't get the tritium out of the water in Fukushima, which is considering, uh, continuing to be a considerable problem. And that's almost just glossed over. And that ties into, even when nuclear power plants are running properly, go ahead and look up what a routine release is. Routine releases give you what Helen Caldercott calls, uh, Dr. Caldercott calls a routine cancer. Tritium is one of the elements that are often released into the environment during a routine release, which is something that does when they're running properly. So Arriva is one of the people that have designed this. I just want to throw that out there. And the nuclear waste is housed in steel canisters. The thickness of those canisters continues to be a matter of some debate, but as experts say that the sooner nuclear waste moves to dry storage, the safer Southern California will be. Maybe you shouldn't have built it! I am more worried about the spent fuel left in the pools at San Ofri than about the fuel that was transferred to dry casks, said Edward Lyman, acting director of the Nuclear Safety Project with the nonpartisan and non Nonprofit Union for Concerned Scientists in Washington, D.C. If a large earthquake tore the liner of the pool, causing a rapid loss of cooling water, there is a risk of spent fuel fire that could cause a large dispersal of radioactive material, he said. Although the risk decreases as the spent fuel pools and the pools empty out, it does not go to zero as long as there is fuel in the pools. And also, you've got to remember that cell elements like tritium do die. And other ones like uranium, for all intents and purposes, do not. Their half-life is millions, you know, billions of years. So, technically, I guess it does end at some time, but you know what I mean. The last fuel assemblies were removed from San Ofri reactors in 2012 and have been cooling in the pools for about seven years in Southern California Edison spokesman John Dawkins has said. Lyman noted that the large earthquake and tsunamis at Fukushima Daiichi did not breach the dry casks stored there, nor did it damage the radioactive waste within them. No, but it did trigger the meltdown in one of the reactors prior to the tidal wave hitting. Let me repeat that. It was not the tidal wave which caused one of the meltdowns. It was the quake itself. This is established fact in the title.
timeline of what has happened, what happened in Fukushima. Now, again, I've been saying for a long time, too, look at the history of, uh, hey, Stephen, look at the history of the Earth being hit with um, debris from space. I, you know, rocks, uh, pieces of comets, meteors. Now, think about how many power plants are just peppered all over. Think about how many of them are on the coast, which could see a substantial wave hit them. And, you know, it, it honestly makes you wonder if, <clears throat> you know, it, it's not like a cosmic game of darts at some point. Sooner or later, even an infant is going to hit a, a bullseye or, you know, pop a balloon. For those of you that go to amusement parks like I used to. Remember, friends, it isn't always something that man has done, which will cause these things to create a huge problem. Other than the fact, of course, that man made them. And, you know, who knows? Maybe if the tidal wave hadn't hit, they would have been able to control the reactor that went red or was going red during the original quake. We don't know. Of course, they're going to say they could have because it's in their best interest for the good of the dollar. While Fukushima's dry storage systems are different than San Ofri's, well, it didn't hurt Fukushima's, but then again, oh yeah, ours is different. The tsunami impacts can't directly be compared. Fukushima was a real-world demonstration of the ability of dry casts to withstand, to withstand extreme natural events. Yeah, until a meteor hits it. You know, it all depends on the size of the meteor, I guess. Um, David Lochbaum, recently retired from the Union of Concerned Scientists, has studied Santa Fe closely. His early concerns about an earthquake-inspired landslide onto the dry storage systems were put to rest with detail on land configuration and the selection of the spot for the site systems. He also had concerns about sabotage vulnerabilities, back to what we were saying in regards to terrorism. Holtec's system was developed in response to 9-11, and the company fills its vaults afford better protection against suicide aircraft, bomb-laden trucks, and the like, as well as providing better protection against ground motion from quakes. So they claim that it's going to be able to withstand these sorts of tests. And we can only hope that they are right. But you have to remember how many San Ofris there are, and inevitably will be, as more of these close down. And let's, uh, let's also take a moment to think about what's going to happen 50, 80, 90 years down the line with the ones that are foolishly under construction now. And I've said for a long time that... Uh, and I, the Occupy movement with a bunch of leftist crybabies, if they actually had some cojones, they would find where the nuclear power stations were being constructed, and they would occupy that and refuse to let them break ground under any circumstance. But they didn't. Instead, you know, they, they tried to uh, tried to shake down the rich because all they cared about was the money. Um, AP News. Associated Press, Washington State waterfront owners asked to take dead whales. Now, there are people saying that the die-off that we are seeing in the Pacific Ocean is not a die-off, or that it's not unusual, and that it's happened many times throughout history. It has not happened many times throughout history. There have been instances where, where, let's say, a very large number of whales have died, maybe more than what we've seen so far in a given year. There's been years where uh, the reef has experienced die-offs. There have been times when certain species of fish have experienced die-offs. All of that in numbers that are higher than what we're seeing here. The world has never seen a die-off of this many species in this many numbers ever. So don't give me, you know, oh, look, this is one year when the wild duck died at ten times the rate that it is now. Look at the other species. Why are we, also, why are we seeing it only in one ocean? It just happens to be the ocean where Fukushima is. We're not seeing these crazy things happening off the coast of the, uh, you know, what, Egypt. We're not seeing these kinds of things happen off the coast of England. Why might that be? But don't say the F word. Don't say Fukushima. You might be telling the truth. 
Port Hadlock, Washington, at least one Washington State waterfront landowner has said yes to a request to allow dead gray whales to decompose on their property. So many gray whale carcasses have washed up this year that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Fisheries says that it has run out of places to take them. Why don't you just chop them up and discard them? Does no one have a chainsaw? In Washington, the, 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 the headline should be in Washington, D.C. We don't know how to cut whale. For crying out loud, uh, hire, hire some whale hunters for like, I don't know, an hour. It'll be done. Ridiculous. In response, the agency has asked landowners to volunteer property as a disposal site for the carcasses. By doing, by doing so, landowners can support the natural process of marine environment. And skeletons left behind can be used for educational purposes. Maybe you should check their radiation levels. And not just in the elements which you know won't be there, but in the full scope of all of the radioactive elements which were released from Fukushima. I mean, you have time since the whale is just rotting there, so you have no excuse. The carcasses can be 40 feet long, 12 meters. Uh, that's a lot to decay, and it could take months. Landowner Mario Rivera of Port Hadlock, Washington, told King 5 TV that the smell is intermittent and isn't that intermittent and isn't that bad. That's because salt is a preservative. It is a really unique opportunity to have is here on the beach and monitor it and see how far it goes. Now, again, much of this article does what so much of the media does and starts talking about the idea, you know, that people have rotting whales on their property instead of the bigger picture here. On the U.S. West Coast, about 70 whales have been found dead this year along California, Oregon, Alaska, and Washington, the most since 2000. It's interesting. If you go through my videos, you'll be amazed to see that I said you would find massive numbers of dead whales along California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. And then I didn't think it was a very good idea for anyone to live on the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. So I must have just guessed at those four states because I used that same crystal ball that I talked about earlier. Still, that's a small fraction of the total number because most sink or wash in remote areas and are unrecorded. So there's, they already know that there's more dying than they can actually document. But they, they can tell by how many are washed ashore. They can sort of do the math to tell how many are there based on how many have been seen. And even though you don't see all of them, whether they're alive or dead, you can kind of get a ballpark based on historic numbers where you've done the same thing. That's how that's done. Uh, NOAA Fisheries late last month declared the die-off an unusual mortality event and provided additional resources to respond to the deaths. So even though the system at large is still not wanting to say the F word, Fukushima, they are admitting now that something is wrong. And what I mean by that is just a couple of years ago, Noah was saying that there was going to be no die-off. Now they're saying this is an unusual mortality event. Yeah, you know, it is strange. We don't, we don't know why. Couldn't be Fukushima. Massive amounts of radiation washing into the ocean. Why is it massive when you can produce all kinds of charts and graphs that say that it's not massive? Because those charts and graphs have been jimmied in order to frame the allowances which the nuclear industry has now, if you look at the original material which was produced by the people that broke the atom when this was being done, Manhattan Project, some of the Russian studies, uh, when they were doing it, England, when they were doing it, more realistic numbers were at hand. And there was a reason for that because they were, didn't want an unusual mortality event. With the unusual mortality event of these gray whales, we know more whales will be coming in. And there is a high likelihood that more whales will die within Purgent Sound and out of the coast, on the coast, said Port Townsend Marine Science Center Citizen Science Coordinator Betsy Carlson. Officials say the gray whale population remains strong at 27,000. 
so maybe we should, uh, you know, not panic. I'm sure they'll all just randomly become immune to radiation. It'll be great. Lime is being used to help break down the whale carcasses on the beach near where Riviera and Warag live. Warag. The lime appears to be working. It's decomposing nicely, I think, said Riviera. All right, friends. Uh, this is a short one. NPR.org. It was a number of uh, things that the Supreme Court were doing. And one of the one of the most important decisions that have come out of them have to do with radiation. So I'm going to skip straight to that one here. Um, uranium ban upheld again with an ideological mix. The court upheld Virginia's ban on uranium mining. In a six to three vote, the justices said that the state law was not superseded by the Federal Atomic Energy Act. Writing for the group's major court's majority, Gorsuch said the Atomic Energy Act gives the federal government the authority to regulate nuclear safety, but not <clears throat> the authority to regulate mining itself. Fellow conservatives Thomas and Kavanaugh joined Gorsuch's opinion in full, but liberal justices Ginsburg poisoned for the country. Ginsburg, Sontemeyer, and Kagan agreed only with the bottom line. They refused to sign on to Gorsuch's broad language about matters that they said sweep well beyond the confines of this case. In other words, if we happen to agree that the federal government doesn't have the right to force you to do something, then we side with you. But if we happen to think the federal government should be able to ram something down your throat that we don't want, then we want to be able to do that. That's the typical way that liberals work. Uh, dissenting were Roberts, Breyer, and Alito. And again, that is from uh, NPR, Supreme Court Justices Split Along Unexpected Lines in Three Cases. The Hiding Place. All right, now this, I'm not going to do the whole story because I know about half the people that are listening to this are way into all things that have to do with Fukushima, the aftermath, and nuclear truths, as opposed to the opinions which people give. Um, this is a must-read for those people. PSMag.com, The Hiding Place, Inside the World's First Long-Term Storage Facility for Highly Radioactive Nuclear Waste. You need to read that article. It's an excerpt from Robert McFarland's new book, Underling. And again, uh, if you've ever read, um, oh, I think Swan Song might be one of the best... Uh, fictional books on something like this. <clears throat> this is a factual. And I just want to say, basically what the art, and there's, there's a YouTube documentary about this too, and it's it's very cryptic. It's, it's very moody and dark. Um, they in Finland, are digging what amounts to an extremely deep tunnel, and then reinforcing it with rock, and burying it, and planting trees again in the hope that nuclear waste could be stored there permanently without ever being touched. Some people have said that this would be a solution which would solve anything but the most extreme of meteor strikes. Again, could a meteor strike do it? How big is the meteor? A meteor, a meteor of a big enough, you know, big enough chunk of whatever could kill off every living thing in the world if it's big enough, so who knows? But unless that were to happen, this is something that, according to science, has the best chance of working now that we have foolishly done the unthinkable by even creating these monstrosities. One of the, one of the problems, though, is how to warn future generations to stay away from it. Let's say a thousand years from now. They want to go exploring there. They find it somehow under the trees. Maybe it shows up on some kind of technology they have as something strange beneath the ground. This could happen if, if they're looking for oil, looking for minerals, gold, silver, platinum. If, if they have some reason to look into the earth in this area, then they would find this huge graveyard of nuclear, uh, nuclear waste. And thousands of years from now, we don't know how to communicate with them in a way that would tell them to not enter this area. 
not to disturb what is here. Think about the, the dire warnings which were written on Egyptian burial sites, for example, but yet people still run in. They still disturb what they weren't supposed to disturb. How do you warn somebody that this is a matter of life and death when the language that we speak may not be understood? When nothing that we say or convey in images now can be understood to mean this will kill you, your world, the people that touch it, stay away. How do we tell them? That's become one of the really big problems that they're finding with this. <clears throat> but it's in Finland. Um, deep in the bedrock of Olik. Olek Luoto Island in southwest Finland, of which I'm sure I'm just destroying the poor name, a tomb is under construction. The tomb is intended to outlast not only the people who designed it, but also the species that designed it. It is intended to maintain its integrity without future maintenance of any kind for 100,000 years, able to endure a future ice age. 100,000 years ago, Three major river systems flowed across the Sahara. It's now a desert. 100,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans were beginning their journey out of Africa. The oldest pyramid is only around 4,600 years old, and the oldest surviving church building is fewer than 2,000 years old. This finished tomb has some of the most secure containment protocols ever devised, more secure than the crypts of the pharaohs, more secure than the supermax prison, any. It is hoped that what is placed within this tomb will never leave it by any means of any agency other than the geological. The tomb is an experiment in post-human architecture, and its name is Ankalo, which in Finnish means cave or hiding place. What it is to be hidden in a hollow is high-level nuclear waste, perhaps the darkest matter that humans have ever made. For as long as we have been producing nuclear waste, we have been failing to decide how to dispose of it. Uranium was created in a supernova in supernova explosions around 66 billion years ago, and is part of the space dust of which the planet is formed. It is, a co it is as common in the Earth's crust as tin or tungsten, and it is dispersed within the rocks of which we live. Now, a lot of people say, well, that proves that nuclear is safe. There is a process that is given to uranium once it is mined, which makes it far more deadly. Slowly, expensively, miraculously, injuriously, we have learned how to convert uranium into power and into force. We know how to make electricity from uranium, and we know how to make death from it, but we still do not know how to best dispose of it when it the work is done, when its work for us is done. Over a quarter of a million tons of high-level nuclear waste is in need of final storage, and presently, throughout the exist globally, there are around 12,000 tons being added to that figure annually. And again, the article is quite exhaustive, and um, it talks about some of the places that they tried to build it in America, only to find out after spending a fortune that it would not work, that it would not be able to withstand the punishment that would be coming at it. So this is important to look at. Um, again, just getting the material to Finland, if you were trying to do it from other areas, could be a problem. And there's not a lot of places like Finland, geologically speaking, that could handle such a massive job. So, I mean, I think you should look it up. I really do. I also think you should look at the documentary. I forget its name, but if you type in the name of the facility, on call, of course, and search it on YouTube, it's the, it's the, I think it's like an hour and a half documentary that comes up, and it's very in-depth. And it's some idea of the magnitude of the problem which we have when that problem of course is nuclear energy all right guys russia accused of a cover-up over lethal submarine fire now, russia has a you know russia and japan just don't have very good luck with anything nuclear 
I know there's lots of other areas, you know, America's had issues, England, I get it, but Russia and Japan need to stay away from all things nuclear. According to history, Russian officials faced accusations. Now, again, this may have been negated. This was the third. And on the 12th, I, I looked up some articles. Some people are still asking questions about it. Some say it's been put to rest. Maybe by the time you hear this, it will be. Russian officials faced accusations of trying to cover up the full details of an accident on board a military submarine that killed 14 sailors. But the Kremlin on Wednesday defended its record. You know, the, the, the Kremlin the Kremlin defending their record is a lot like Hitler defending his record. Uh, I don't mean that, you know, the Kremlin is Nazis. What I mean is they're known for lying. Um, when Mayak happened, it was the nuclear disaster that happened before Chernobyl. We're not really sure how bad Mayak, Mayak was. We do know that the entire area is being used like a giant science fair petri dish experiment or something with the people that are still there. They can't afford to leave, so they get paid to stay, which is basically the government paying them to die. And of course, the government does autopsies, then it can tell what nuclear poisons do what over the long term. That was the first disaster. Of course, the Kremlin was complicit in hiding it, not telling people, even though, quote, the skin was sloughing off of people's bones when the disaster occurred. And then Chernobyl happened, and they hid that too. Until Sweden and other countries you know, were glowing with radiation, showing that there was a problem at Chernobyl. Otherwise, they wouldn't have told anybody at all. They would have just left everyone there die. So the Kremlin defending their record is not exactly making me feel any better, but I digress. It said that the uh, the defense ministry said the accident took place on Monday, but it was not officially disclosed until late Tuesday. Well, isn't that just par for the course? That's some, that's definitely defending their record. I have to give them credit there. At least they were honest. They were honest that they're lying. It said that the sailors had been killed in a fire and on what it is described as a deep water research submarine surveyed the seabed near the Atlantic. Uh, we also know it's one of the most secretive um, vessels in the entire Russian Navy, probably in all of Russia. And what it does beyond that of science in terms of uh, war implications are almost beyond the scope. We know more about, you know, V. Canis Majoris than we do about this thing. Nearly two days on, there was still no word on whether the submarine had been nuclear-powered. But as some Russian media criticized what they said was a lack of transparency. In Russia, never! And drew parallels with the dearth of official information during the meltdown of Soviet nuclear reactor Chernobyl in 86. <clears throat> Absolutely nothing is known at the moment. Who, what, I don't understand one thing. Why did a day go by and only then did they make the statement about the deceased, said Yevgenia Buntman, an author, an, an anchor, excuse me, for the Ebko Muschevi radio station. Well, one of them is they didn't want to have international help being offered because they don't want international help tinkering with their precious little vessel. And the best way to save face by not looking like you don't care about the people that are trapped and refusing the help is to simply not tell anybody for a day, which prevents them offering to help. So even though maybe outside, uh, outside work, outside workers uh, help from another country, maybe U.S. technology, maybe British technology, maybe something could have helped the, the sailors and gotten them up from the seafloor. It would be better for them in the government's eyes, perhaps, if they just died than it is to bring other nations in to get a look at this super secret ship. So that's one reason it's done. Why don't we know their names? Is this normal? The Russian media outlet RBC cited an unnamed a military source as saying the submarine was an AS-12, which is powered by a nuclear reactor and that is de designed to carry out specific operations at extreme depths. Depth. The vessel nicknamed Lushyark, it's uh, named after a cartoon of, uh, it's a, I think it's a giraffe or a horse made out of balloons. It's a cartoon in Russia, and it looks like it. 
the tomato, the balloon, that's how it got the name, was launched in 2003 and is one of the most secret submarines in the Russian fleet. No abnormal radiation, so we don't know if it's nuclear powered, but it doesn't look like it's blasting out a ton of radiation on the ocean floor, at least that we can tell. Asked on Wednesday if the vessel had a nuclear reactor on board, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peshkov referred the question to the defense ministry. Look, it's not that hard. Yes or no, he knows the answer to the damn question. It's not like they sent him up there without knowing if it was powered by nuclear technology or not. Get over, it's ridiculous. He also, you're defending the, on, the, the history of the Kremlin. There's a stellar job happening right here. He also told reporters that details of the submarine were classified, but that information has been provided in good time. Oh, yeah, great time. People dying on the ocean floor. You sure are expedient. Russian state-owned media, including television network channels, uh, have reported the fire and the deaths, but have avoided any criticism of the government's handling of the incident. Yeah, I know. They make it a... a, a, a um, nuclear poison cheeseburger. That's a real common way of uh, executing people you don't like in Russia. Uh, the state-owned media, I'm sorry, but the Bell, a news site often critical of the government, wrote, nearly a day without information about an accident in a nuclear facility and the need to look out for Norwegian statements on the level of radiation should have given a shudder to those who remember the Chernobyl power station. So I, I, I bet you guys better not leave a drink unattended. <laughs> it might be glowing green when you come back. Um, that's interesting. They're smart enough to look to Norway to find signs of radiation because they can't trust their government to tell them they know this after Mayek and Chernobyl. Norway's Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority, the DSA, it's the way the acronym works in their language, said on Wednesday it had not detected any abnormal radiation in the area and that its measures tallied with public information provided by Moscow. So, so far, so far, we're all right. Um, the head of Greenpeace, Norway, Fraud Flem, urged authorities in Moscow to be fully transparent. Good luck with that in order to safeguard the interests both of Russia and neighboring countries like Norway. Of course, it talks about the, uh, in August of 2000, when a nuclear-powered ship called the Kursk sank to the floor of the Barents Sea, killed all 118 people, and that was an instance where they were offered help, and there were other countries that could have saved those men, and they did not do it in time. But it's a matter of historical fact. Don't question me on it. All right, friends, and that brings us to... Oh, I hear something. You hear it, too. The Dump Day of the Day! Now, for those of you that don't know, every month we have the Dump's Cap of the Month Award. In the Dump's Cap of the Month Award, I go through countless stories of true idiots, and I bring you all of their silliness. You are an idiot. And I bring you all of their silliness, all of their insanity, and I find the stupidest story of the month, and I mail them a dump cap. I do have to get the one from last month in the mail. The holiday has everything behind, but it will be done. With that in mind, friends, of course, we do the dumb of the day. And that is the stupidest story that I found for this topic that I did for any given show. And since I'm only doing two shows, that would be Fukushima related. And if you want to donate, uh, don't forget you can do so at the correct views at hotmail.com through PayPal. As you can see, this takes a lot of work. I'm not going to lie, it does. It takes a lot of time to put together, so please um, be kind enough to donate at the correct views at hotmail.com through PayPal. I put the money towards a better show. Friends, uh, The Verge, hackers made Iran's nuclear computers blast ACDC. Now, Iran is winning the dunce cap of the month here because not only are they trying to, they are fighting, I should say, for the right to build a nuclear power plant on a fault line, an active fault line, an active fault line that leading scientists say is assured to have an eight to nine level seismic event in that area during the lifetime of the plant, which is the same thing we heard at Fukushima from literally the same scientific people. 
Not only is Iran trying to do that, which even if they were an honest country, even if they were not chanting death to Israel and death to America, even if they weren't Islamic nutcases, I'm not going to say that all Islamic people are nutcases, no. If there's, we have nutcase Christians, we have nutcase Islamists. I'm a Christian, I'm not a nutcase Christian. They are nutcase Islamists in Iran. Yes, I said it. Not only are these idiots trying to endorse building a nuclear power plant on an active fault line, which is going to produce a massive quake during the time that their plant is sitting there, but they have no security. Baffled scientists say thunderstruck by ACDC played in the middle of the night. Hackers made Iran's nuclear computers blast ACDC. Now, hell's bells, friends. Um, somebody got that joke. Um, it's a double joke. They don't even have the ability to stop evil Western music from playing through what is supposed to be a very secure facility in the middle of the night. Oh, but all oh, wants us to build a nuclear power plant. Between 2009 and 2010, Iran's nuclear program was the target of a devastating cyber attack. A virus reportedly developed by the American and Israeli governments and known as Stuxnet took control of centrifuge controls in facilities across the country, causing thousands of machines to break. But apparently the hackers weren't content with just crippling the country's nuclear efforts. They want to show their control in another way. To do that, they reportedly hijacked the facility's workstation and used them to play ACDC. Ha, those dirty deeds were not done dirt cheap. And they played it loud. It should be loudly. Good writing, Verge. Speaking at the Black Hat Security Conference, Finnish computer expert Miko Hyopinen recalled an email he received from an Iranian scientist at the time of the Stuxnet attacks. Venture Beat quotes from the correspondence. There was some music playing randomly on several of the workstations during the middle of the night with the volume maxed out. I believe it was the American band ACDC, Thunderstruck. It was very, very strange and happened very quickly. The attackers also managed to gain root access to the machine and they entered from and removed all the logs. Now, let us think for a minute where Iran is. I mean, culturally, their enemies, if they hack into this system, are going to do a lot more than just play ACDC at a high volume. After all, rock and roll ain't noise pollution. All right, I'm done. I won't do it again. I promise. I promise. I could. Don't, don't tempt me. But um, they're going to melt it down if they can. They're going to hurt things. There's already rumors that the Stuxnet virus led to the Fukushima disaster. But, I mean, what were you doing? Putting putting your jump drive into the... the, the you, you're not supposed to put anything that has access to the Internet or has ever been on the Internet into the system of a that runs a nuclear reactor. So if someone did that on accident, they should be fired on the spot. If it was done on purpose, how is it that that wasn't seen? So, I mean, there's ambiguity there. We may never know if it was done or how it was done because they don't want it repeated. Even if they fixed it there, of course, you'd have the problem elsewhere if you released how it was done. But these things are not meant to be on the Internet. Uh, of course, Thunderstruck is a song from the 1990 album Razor's Edge, not a suffix to the Australian band's name, as the scientist can be forgiven for getting it wrong. Uh, he thought the band was ACDC Thunderstruck. Under the country's censorship laws, only Iranian folk, classic, or pop music is acceptable. That's hilarious. Although, they should have picked something like COD, which stands for Call on the Devil. Uh, and again, ACDC is not a satanic band, but they have written about things which would definitely be much more offensive than Thunderstruck. But anyway, under the country's censorship laws, uh, I read that, I'm sorry. Since the Stuxnet attack, President Obama has reportedly warned against using cyber weapons to target other countries for fear that their source code could be reproposed and turned back on the United States. Well, maybe you shouldn't have created it then. As yet, the president hasn't commented on the dangers of deploying 
ACDC. All right, friends, do me a favor. Make sure you donate at the correct views at hotmail.com. Hello, Renata. Thank you for listening, everyone. And uh, hey, good night. God bless. See you, media speakers. Thank you, my subscribers.